Well, hello and welcome to this week's online talk from St John's Church in Highbridge. It's good to see you and good to be with you today. I want to begin with a prayer. Gracious Father, revive your church in our day and make her holy, strong and faithful for your glory's sake. In Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. So our readings today. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 to 16, and then John chapter 6, 24 to 35. If you could ask the Lord Jesus one question, what would it be? Perhaps you'd ask him who he is, really. Perhaps you'd ask him how he did that trick with the loaves and the fishes. Perhaps you'd ask him whether the church was really what he had in mind all along. Perhaps you'd ask him something more personal to you. Jesus, do you hear me when I pray? Jesus, do you love me? Why, Jesus, did the one I love have to die? Well, today's passage in John's Gospel is a question and answer session between the crowd on the one hand and Jesus on the other. And the crowd is drawn from the 5,000 that Jesus fed on the mountainside. And having caught up with Jesus by the lake, they ask him three questions. The first question is a very practical question, almost banal. Rabbi, when did you come here? They say. It seems they're just confused as to how Jesus made it from one side of the lake to the other when they didn't see him get into the boat. Now remember that the crowd, unlike the disciples, have not witnessed Jesus walking on the water. They've been asleep bellies full of fish and bread. So stumbling out of the boats with their rubbing the sleep from their eyes, they uh, see Jesus at the lakeside and they say, oh, teacher, well, when did you come here? Did you come on the 832 from Capernaum or something? Now perhaps we too have such basic, practical, if you like, questions about Jesus. How and when did Jesus get here into our world, into our history, into our culture? Well, we can look at historical documents and study ancient languages and learn principles of interpretation. We can learn about the ancient world, its geography, its archaeology and so on. We can use sophisticated dating methods to try and work out when Jesus was born. In all these ways, we can try and get close to what scholars call the historical Jesus. But when Jesus himself answers the crowd in John 6, he doesn't give them evidence so much as a challenge. As is so often the case, Jesus goes beyond the surface questions to these underlying motives. You are looking for me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves, he says. So what the crowd think they want is more of the magically multiplied bread. But what they need well, that's something else entirely. It's not about the food that perishes, says Jesus, but about the Son of Man. I wonder what this answer of Jesus says to us. We may well look to Jesus to provide for our material needs. Heaven knows when I see the needs around us, uh, that's what I do. So too, we may well look to Jesus for those concrete facts and figures that will render our faith plausible. But following Jesus is actually about something deeper than both of those. It's about identifying the deep ache in our souls that only Christ can satisfy. Identifying this ache, this hollowness that Dan spoke of last week. Well, this takes hard spiritual work. And it may mean going to some very uncomfortable places within ourselves. But in those places, perhaps especially there, we begin to find the Son of Man. So let's move on to the second question that the crowd asks. What must we do to perform the works of God? When I go and visit a baptism family, they sometimes want to know what they need to perform in order to get their child baptised? Is there a fee to pay? Do they have to attend church regularly? 
It's no bad thing in some ways when they ask these things because it shows that they're taking it seriously. But the answer I give, or try to anyway, is the one that Jesus gives to the crowd in John 6. He says, this is the work of God that you believe in him whom he has sent. That's it. You've just got to believe in Jesus. So what does this word believe really mean? Well, it's not only an intellectual or moral belief, the kind that can be proved through evidence. It's rather more like trust. And that's what Martin Luther taught, that belief is really a lot more like trust. It's a much more personal word, isn't it? And that's why in the baptism service we ask our candidates, do you believe and trust in God? To which the reply is, I believe and trust in him. It's worth asking ourselves these questions too. Do we put our trust in institutions or in Jesus himself? Do we put our trust in our own ability to form opinions or in Jesus' ability to shape our character? Whether we've been coming to church for donkey's years or whether we're simply dropping in for a christening, saying to Jesus, I believe and trust in you, it's just about the most powerful thing you can do. So we intuitively, don't we, want to know more about this person that we're being asked to trust. So here's the crowd's third question. What sign are you going to give us, they say. What sign are you going to give us? Now, back in the days of their desert wanderings, the Israelites had been fed by manna, bread that fell from heaven. And the crowd here wants something similarly spectacular from Jesus. Now, it's a curious request, seeing as they've just experienced the miracle of the loaves and fishes on the mountainside. But Jesus teases out their questioning yet again. He speaks of a bread that comes from God. And eagerly the crowd reply, Sir, give us this bread always. And then Jesus spells it out, saying, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry. And whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. And like the sun suddenly cresting the horizon, Jesus' answer breaks in. Because the true and best answer to all our questions comes not in evidence, not in arguments, not in miracles, but in the presence of a person. Now I have a job where I meet a lot of people, I've talked about some already, and when I go and see someone for a visit, or when somebody uh, comes to my door asking me a question, I may have a million other things on my mind, leaky church roofs, council license applications, sermons that stubbornly refuse to write themselves. But when I have that meeting with someone, that encounter, I try and put all that stuff to one side. I try to be fully present to that person, to give them my full attention. Oftentimes I fail, and you'll see me fail, but I still make the effort because I believe in a ministry of presence. A technical way of putting it would be to say that the truth of our theology is proved in pastoral practice. Perhaps a better way of putting it would be to say that our questions of faith are answered by the sheer presence of the person in front of us. Our questions of faith are answered by the sheer presence of the person in front of us. Now in many ways, the greatest scientific miracle is simply that anything exists at all. It's astonishingly unlikely that the universe should have exploded into being. And this sheer fact of being is only eclipsed by the sheer fact of relating. As if it weren't enough that the universe exists, a world exists full of creatures capable of love. Creatures like you and me. Creatures who can say to ourselves and to one another, I am. I am. 
two little words that contain so much. When God appeared to Moses in the burning bush, Moses asked him his name. And God replied, I am. And this name, I am, became so holy that the Jews still will not speak it out loud. Now when Jesus stood in front of his questioners by the lakeside, he too said, I am. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the gate, the shepherd, the way, the truth, the life. The images are wonderful, but the common thread that binds them together is this phrase, I am. We trust in a God then who says, I am. Is this enough for us? When I pray, I, I think I often want an instrumental Jesus, a Jesus who fixes things. Or I want a therapeutic Jesus, a Jesus who takes away the pain. But what I get instead is a Jesus who sits with me in the pain of an unfixed life and says, I am. I am. And somehow that's enough. Somehow that's enough. How then can we know this? How can we experience the I am of Jesus? in a way that stills our questioning and fills our hollow souls. Two things briefly. One way that Jesus is present with us is in the bread and wine of the Eucharist. And when we come to the altar, when we see and we receive the bread, there he is. The bread has a function and its function is to point us to the presence It's to point us to the I am of Jesus. And as we receive the sacrament, we find, I hope, that Jesus is indeed present with us. All our questions are answered in that moment, at least for a few precious seconds. Now at the end of the Eucharist, we're sent out into the world And this leads me to the second way that we can know Jesus' presence, and that's through one another. I've already spoken a bit about this. To attend to another human being is to attend to Jesus. Jesus is present in his church, in this loving, interdependent body of Christ that St Paul speaks about so beautifully in Ephesians. But it's not only in the church. Mother Teresa, now Saint Teresa of Calcutta, she spoke many times of seeing the face of Jesus in the face of the poor. So the I am presence of Jesus is actually all around us if we have the faith to see it. In the schools, the shops, the surgery and the streets. Seek him there and seek your answers in the faces of his beloved. We started with questions and we'll end with questions. I've said my piece and it's over to you now. How will Jesus be present with you in the remainder of today's service? How will Jesus be present to you in the remainder of this Sunday? How will Jesus be present to you this week, this summer, this year, and in the years that lie ahead? These, I would suggest, are the questions that really matter. Ask them, live them, and let Jesus' I am be to you an answer. Amen.